Welcome back. Um, we've covered so far in this course on designing a database solution, um, a little bit about managing uh, databases and database servers in, in the enterprise, and then a, a complete overview of security and the security architecture and some considerations for designing security in your database. What we're gonna look at in this third module is designing a backup and uh, restore solution to uh, recover your database in the event of uh, any disasters uh, are happening to it and, uh, and to give you that business continuity um, approach of keeping your databases backed up so they can be restored. So um, Christian, I'm going to get you to perhaps just tell us what we're going to cover in this module. Great, thanks Graham. So, so what we wanted to talk about in this module was first of all um, a review uh, of backup and recovery strategy, so some fundamentals of backup and recovery in SQL Server. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, a relatively new feature for SQL Server, and that's backing up to uh, Azure Blob Storage, so the ability to back up to a URL effectively. Um, and then we're going to look at some advanced restore scenarios that I think will be really useful, for, particularly for those studying the exam, um, to get a, a flavour of, of these kind of extra periphery bits that you might miss if you were studying on your own. Sure, okay, that's great. And uh, of course, backup and recovery is, is the bread and butter of a, a, a DBA. It's a huge part of the responsibility of a, of a DBA. So let's, uh, let's drill in and take a look at some backup and recovery strategies that people may be familiar with, but let's just refresh our Absolutely. memories a bit. Okay, so we'll jump straight into uh, recovery models here. So recovery models, uh, user databases and all databases in SQL Server actually, um, can be in one of three recovery models. So the first we have there is a simple recovery model. And what we're saying, uh, what we're telling SQL Server when we're in simple recovery mode is that I don't want to do any point in time recovery. So when I commit data and it goes into the transaction log, I'm not interested in, in keeping that data any further. So I'm not going to be taking transaction log backups. And in fact, when you're in simple recovery mode, um, SQL Server won't allow you to, to take transaction log backups. So it's, I guess it's a simple, from a manageability perspective, it means I don't have to worry about truncating the log, I don't have to worry about uh, having a transaction log backup separately from the database backup. That sounds great, but it does, as you say, mean that if I need to recover the database to a specific point of failure or to a specific time, I can't do that. I can exactly. basically just recover a full database backup. Exactly. So typically this would be used... For databases where you know the rate of change is very low, so you're quite happy maybe just to have nightly full backups um, and you don't need those transaction log backups. Development environments, quite often you'll run them in simple because you don't want um, point in time recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's, it is a very useful uh, recovery model, but the caveats are around data recovery essentially. All right, well, talk to me about the opposite extreme. Talk to me about a full recovery model. Then. So full recovery uh, provides all the bells and whistles. So what we're saying essentially is when I change data, when I update data, I want the details of those changes to be kept in the transaction log until I back them up. And the reason I want to back them up is because I want to minimize my data loss window. And it also provides me, these transaction log backups provide me with a point in time recovery. So I've got, a, in addition then, I guess, to taking a, a full database backup, which typically you would do periodically anyway, I can back up the transaction log in between. And it, it's maintaining a record of the transactional changes that were committed to the database so that I could recommit yeah, them and effectively exactly. rebuild that database back to where exactly. it was lost. Okay. So, so something to bear in mind when you're in full recovery, you have to have transaction log backups because any ch data change at all will be stored in the transaction log and the only thing that's going to manage that space um, is a transaction log backup. So a full backup won't truncate the transaction log. Okay, so um, certainly in my experience, most, most of the time the choice is between simple and full, mm -hmm. but there is of course a third option as well. There's the, the bulk logged model. Tell yes, me a little bit absolutely. about that. So bulk logs is specifically to um, speed up the process of, of bulk logged operations. So where you've got a high rate of insert. So we'd use these in, in data warehousing scenarios where we're doing a massive data load. And what we're essentially saying is um, don't log every insert 
um, we're doing a bulk logged operation. So it means that the load, the data insert itself, will be uh, much quicker because we're mm -hmm. not having to log each operation. Okay. And then at the end of that process, um, SQL Server will take a delta and, and dump that information down into the transaction log. So there's a common misconception around um, using bulk log to reduce the size of the transaction log backups. Okay. Um, so an index rebuild, for example, um, uh, is a bulk logged operation. And um, you could uh, put your database in bulk logged mode, and that will speed up the, the time it takes to do an index rebuild. Um, but it doesn't reduce the transaction log backup space requirements. So instead of having, say, a one gig log backup every 15 minutes as you were doing a rebuild, mm -hmm. um, all of that space will be saved up and you'll get one big log backup at the end of that process. Right, okay. Because, of, of course, the, the transaction log in SQL Server, just again to remind people, it's a write-ahead log mechanism that we yes, use. So, exactly. so SQL Server logs what it's going to do when it starts a transaction. It logs the fact the transaction started, and it's only when we get a, a commit that's logged that we know that that data is safe to be persisted, that that, that transaction exactly. is complete. And then at a checkpoint, we actually flush the pages that were changed in memory to the disk. So I, I'm from what you're saying then, in, in, in a full recovery model, everything is right ahead. So whenever I do any insert, we write ahead that we're, we're actually starting this insert and we, we commit the transaction, we write that we're committing the transaction and we checkpoint. Mm -hmm. But with a, a bulk logged operation, we don't write ahead of every individual insert. We still log exactly. the fact that we've done the inserts. We log the before and after image, if you like. But um, effectively, we're allowing us to just to get on with doing the inserts nice and quickly and then worry about logging it all when it's, exactly. when it's actually done. Exactly. And one thing to bear in mind as well with bulk logged, because it's um, you can think of it as a variation on full rather than a, a variation on simple, because you can still do transaction log backups mm -hmm. while you're in bulk logged mode, but you can't do point in time recovery. And that's because you're not logging um, every, as you every go, transaction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks for that. That explains the, the recovery models. Let's talk then about the, the backup test. We've mentioned a couple. We've mentioned full backups and we've mentioned transaction log yeah. backups. That's not the whole story. So, so tell us a little bit about some of the options there. So, so we've got full backup at the top there, which we've already talked about. Um, we've got a differential backup there. So a differential backup is the parts of the database that have changed since the last full database backup. Okay. So, uh, and then next line there, we have a transaction log backup. And a, another way to think of a transaction log backup is uh, as an incremental backup, whereas a differential, so um, the transaction log backups are um, cumulative, if you like. So if you're taking transaction log backups to do a recovery, you need all of the transaction logs in order to do a recovery. Because everything that's, that's changed. Yeah. yeah. Whereas for a differential, it's everything since the last full backup. So if you take a full backup on a Sunday and you take differential backups nightly during the week, you only need your last diff and the original full to do a, to, to do a recovery. And I guess one of the things that's important to, to call out here is for both full and differential backups, we're talking about backing up the data pages themselves, the, the, the data files that contain yes, the data, absolutely. which is why with that differential, we want all of the ones that changed since the last full backup because to restore, we restore the full and then apply the latest versions of the, yes, absolutely. Yeah, the, the, the pages. Whereas the transaction log, actually what we're doing is recording the actions that were performed to the data pages. We're not actually copying the data pages. We're going to replay those transactions mm. against the, the backup we've restored, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the next on the list there, so we have, we can do specific file group backups. So if we have um, a higher rate of change on specific file groups, and it, um, we looked at um, file groups in the, the previous course we did, didn't we? Mm -hmm. um, and then we have partial backup types there. So this is where we're backing up the primary file group and all the read-write file groups. A tail log backup. So a tail log backup is something that um, every DBA should know what a tail log backup is, but it's very difficult to remember it in the situation where you're trying to do recovery. So essentially, it's the uh, you've got a corrupt database 
but you can still do this tail log back up to get the very last log record still in the log in order to minimize your data loss. Um, and it's a really, it's quite a common topic around training and things like that. But, mm. but we see um, when we're doing recruitment and we do DBA recruitment, there's so many people just miss the tail log backups, even though they know it. It they is just very easy to forget. And I, I mean, this kind of talks to some of the issues about backup and restore. Recovering databases in the event of, of something going wrong is more than just a question of being able to apply restores. You kind of have to keep your head. You're in a situation that's quite a stressful situation. You've got a database that's that's perhaps a, you know a business critical database, and you've got to you know to get it back up as quick, quickly as you can. You first of all got to find the right backups and make sure if you're applying transaction log backups, you're applying them in the right order and all that kind of thing. And, and it can be quite easy to forget that okay, we've lost the database, we may have lost the data files, but the disk holding the transaction log may still be accessible. Exactly. In which case I might want to grab any transactions that were logged that I haven't backed up in order to be able to get myself right to the point where the whole thing fell over. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and finally, we have copy only um, on there. So copy only allows you to take um, a, a differential backup, a differential or a log backup um, that doesn't break um, the sequence of backups. So if you have a differential backup, that would be dependent on the uh, the last full backup. Mm. Um, Sorry, I meant a copy only for full backups, full backups and, trans yeah. and transaction yeah. log backups. So if we have a system where we're doing a nightly full, for example, and then we've got um, maybe every 12 hours we're doing a differential backup, and somebody comes along and says, can I have a copy of that database, please? So they take uh, a full backup and take it off, and they use it and then ditch it. Because they've taken that full backup, every subsequent differential backup is now dependent on that no. backup. Yeah. yeah. So, so what we can do is uh, enable these copy-only backups. So you can take a full backup on a copy-only, and that means that you're not going to reset that uh, that differential bitmap. Okay. Right. Great. So that's, that's a, a full list of different types of backups that we've got, and I guess using a combination of these gives me various different strategies that I can take to, exactly. to prevent my database. So. Let's let, let's talk about what are, what are some of the things I might want to think about when I'm first starting to plan my strategy, mm -hmm. and we'll talk about recovery objectives. So, so these are terms that uh, this is how we would articulate our, our recovery um, um, a recovery time objective. First of all, is RTO, and and this is the maximum time it can take to recover. So, um, how quickly do I need to be back up and running? Um, and then as well as that, we have RPO, so recovery point objective. So it sounds quite severe to say how much data can you afford to lose. And None is usually exactly, the answer. Yeah. Exactly, you get that answer. But, but the reality is, you know, if I could um, restore a database from last night, would that be acceptable? Because you may not have any changes from, from now until last night. So it's not a guaranteed amount of data loss. It's just a time period in which um, you could have, have data loss, if that makes sense. So I guess, I mean, looking at both of these and the recovery time objective, if I were an, an online retailer, for example, every second that the database is down, I'm losing money because exactly. I'm expecting people to be placing orders. So I want to get that recovery time objective is going to be Pretty quick, really. I want to get yeah. the database back as quickly as I can. Uh, whereas perhaps if it's a, a payroll database in, a, in an organization where I run the payroll once a month, as long as we're not actually at the payroll day, then okay, we might have some time to get it back. And even if we are, I guess in ex extenuating circumstances, you could delay running the payroll until you get the database back up and, yeah, and run exactly. it. Exactly. And you could also think about um, financial transactions, for example. Um, if you're dealing with uh, the banks and, and credit cards or cash machines, the integrity of that data is more important than the availability of it. Sure. Um, so the recovery point objective, so the how much data can you afford to lose, is zero mm -hmm. in that scenario. And you're prepared to do that, but take longer to recover. So your RTO may be a bit more flexible. It may not be attractive, sure. but you absolutely can't lose any data. Okay. All right, so that's those two. Now, we've got here that the backup strategy should map to those requirements. So clearly those different types of backups that I saw can be combined to make a strategy. 
And what's going to determine the right strategy for me is largely going to be the RTO and RPO that I'm trying exactly. to achieve. Exactly. Okay. A um, couple of other things you mentioned on there. Um, we talked about the types of backup and how frequently we, yeah. we, we take those backups. The media, you've mentioned media on the slide here. What, mm. what do we want to say about... So, so media is essentially a disk. Mm -hmm. So I think you used to be able to back up to tape. tape I don't know yeah. if you still can anymore or if that's mm, deprecated. I believe it's deprecated. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we're backing up to disk. You can also back up to URL, which we, we'll mm -hmm. talk about shortly. And um, I don't know if there are any other media types apart from that. Do you know? I think that, that's it for, for backing up in terms of media. I, I guess what I would say about media is not just the type of media in terms of backing up to a, a, a tape or a disc. We organize our, our, our backups into media sets. Yes. So you, you yeah. have a named set which might have multiple backups in that backup set. And I might rotate those backup sets yeah. um, you know, to, to maintain the media. The other thing is that you've got to think about where you're going to store that media. So if, if, if you're going to back up, it's, it's probably quite desirable to back up to something that's locally attached because it's going to be nice and quick. But then if the server goes down or if there's a catastrophic flood or, or something happens, you don't want to lose the backups as well as the database. Exactly, so yeah. you're going to want to think about storing those backups off-site or, or elsewhere, which is why the whole backup to Azure approach is, is very appealing because then your backups are stored out Absolutely. in the cloud. The retention period uh, is mentioned there as well. I mean, I guess one of the considerations is how long do I hold on to the backup media for? And again, it's tempting to say, well, I've, you know, I've got my latest backups. I can discard all my older backups. Well, you might want to revert to an earlier point. You might want to get back to a point Absolutely. before something happened. Or you might just want to keep that, that backup media in case you lose the more recent backup media as a kind of you know, fail-safe point that you can recover mm -hmm. to. So that will be part of your, um, your overall strategy. And I, I guess the, the, the final thing we've got on the slide is, is um, testing, uh, testing your backup. The one time you do not want to be testing your backup strategy for the first time is when your database has actually failed. Absolutely. So you do want to make sure that you can recover ahead of time. You're familiar with the process. Generally, most DBAs maintain a, people call it different things, quite often a run book, some sort of documentation. And in that documentation, you will write down the steps required to find the right media, to take your tail log back up, and make sure that you then apply the backups in the right order. Because the last thing you want when everything is falling apart around you is to be panicking, trying to remember things. It's good to have that documentation and it's good to have tested that documentation to know if it all goes wrong, we're pretty confident we can recover. So, full database backup strategies then. So, we've mentioned full database uh, mm. backups as well. So, in this example here, we've got quite a common scenario here of, of doing nightly full full database backups. So, we're backing all of the data, backing up all of the data. We've got a very self-contained um, backup there, but the recovery is to the time that you've taken the backup itself. So, our recovery points here would be, say, midnight when we took the backup, for mm. example, on the Sunday, Monday, um, and the Tuesday. Okay, so, so the simplest approach, I guess, just every now and then, back up the whole database, and if something goes wrong, we can restore that backup, and we're back to where we were when we Absolutely, took the and every backup strategy starts at this point, starts from a full database backup. Okay. So transaction log backups that, that we've, uh, we've talked about already as well. So a transaction log backup strategy involves a full and a transaction log backup because the transaction log backup is really the transactions that have happened since uh, the previous transaction log backup all the way back to, uh, to the last full backup. So in a common strategy for this, uh, we'd have a full backup um, on the Sunday in this example um, and then um, a full backup on the Monday uh, say midnight, and then in between there, in, in a few hourly intervals, or hourly is quite a common a mm. common setup, we'll do a transaction log backup. And what that enables us to do is to recover the database to any point in time within those transaction logs. Mm. Because of course in, in the transaction log itself, the, the, the individual transactions are time stamped. So we know that... Um, if the way that this works is you obviously restore the full backup and then ap apply the transaction log backups. I use the word apply rather than restore. Technically, it's a restore operation, yeah. but actually what's happening is you're replaying the transactions. And one of the options you've got is to be able to say, well, keep replaying the transactions until you get to this specific time or this specific point in the transaction log. And that lets me get to any point 
within that transaction long period. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so differentials, the, the other type of backup we talked about, how, how does that work? Yes, yeah, so in this example here, um, we're looking at full backup, again, midnight every day, uh, and then in between we're doing differential backups. So um, a common scenario that, that you may have is even a weekly um, full backup because you've got quite a big database, mm -hmm. a nightly differential backup, and then hourly transaction log backups is a good place to start. But I mean, it really depends on your uh, recovery point objectives, recovery time objectives, the size of your database, the amount of um, backups that you want to retain in case of corruption or to be able to go back. Okay, and, and, and what would be the benefit then of, of doing, because at the moment in this one, we've got a, let's say a weekly full backup, a daily differential backup and an hourly mm -hmm. transaction log backup. Why bother taking the differential? Why not? If I've got the hourly transaction log backups every hour anyway, what's the point? In so, so you could do in in theory, um, and you could record if you um, you did a full backup on Sunday, and you had hourly transaction log backups throughout the week and nightly differentials. You could uh, restore the full backup and every single log backup because we're not breaking the chain when we mm -hmm. do differential backups. Um, but it could be quicker as a first point to restore the full backup, the latest differential, and then all the transaction logs since the, that latest differential. Um, and it also provides you with um, a bit of redundancy in there as well. If you think you've got hourly transaction log backups, you're doing 24 backups a day across seven days, and it's only going to take one of those to have a problem to break your recovery chain. And having differential backups in the mix there as well gives you an additional kind of recovery point. Right, and I guess the key point is that we, we rest in the event of something failing, we restore the full backup then the last differential. We don't have to restore the transaction logs in between. It's exactly. the, the full, then the very latest differential, and then only the transaction logs after that. Yeah, and yeah. the same with the other way around, where if your differential backup is corrupt, you've still got all of that information, the all the transaction log yeah. backups. It's just a bit more of a, a job to restore them all. Sure. Okay, great. So th this one's perhaps a little more esoteric, and I guess this is going to be much larger databases with multiple mm. file groups and... Uh, uh, cl classically a combination of read-only file groups and read-write um, file groups. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about this then. So, so the idea behind partial backup strategies is that um, you only back up um, the file groups with changed data effectively. So you're having to back up um, file groups with smaller data sets rather than having to back up um, a massive uh, database in its entirety. You're just backing up the subsets of, of data that's changing. So a good example of this, I guess, might be something like a data warehouse. Absolutely. Where most of the data is, is, is pretty static, it's historical, it's not going to change. But I may have my newer records and my fact tables being added to, a, to one specific file group, and that's the one that's volatile. Yeah. So that's the one that I back up. Absolutely. Okay, great. So we've talked about the different types of backups, we've talked about the strategies. Um, one of the things you mentioned was it's possible that I've taken all these transaction log backups or whatever kind of backup and something goes wrong with the backup mm. and then I, I might be stuck. So what can I do to prevent that? So, so there's an interesting feature there um, at the top of the list they're called mirrored media sets. That's an enterprise um, only feature and what it enables you to do effectively is to multicast a single backup stream to, um, to two different devices. So we've used this um, um, in the past, before the, the days of, of large uh, internet pipes. Um, we would use it to do, um, uh, we do a migration of a database from, from one site to another. And uh, in the days where it's quicker to drive it on a disk mm. than it is to, uh, to send it across the internet. Um, and we, but the time was of the essence. So we used a mirrored media set to send the same backup to two different disks, and then we gave uh, those t those disks to do two different couriers to rush on different routes to the same place because um, availability was so critical in this scenario. But the database was so big that we couldn't uh, we couldn't send it across the internet. So it was a, an interesting use case scenario. Right. I guess the key thing is when you mirror the backup. You end up with two copies of the backup, but you only need either one of those to do a restore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you may use this for um, 
on reliable media. Maybe if you were using, um, for some reason, you were using USB discs to extend the, the, your storage uh, space, um, you might uh, mirror that onto two different discs, so you've got a bit of redundancy. Be safe. Okay. What about some of the other options here? So the checksum backup option. So this is um, alluding to the backup integrity that, that mm. you were mentioning earlier. So um, the checksum um, operation effectively at the end of the backup, SQL Server will calculate a checksum of the whole backup and will write that um, with the backup itself. And the next time when you come to read the backup, SQL Server will recalculate the checksum check to see if the original checksum is the same, and that's how SQL Server will know whether that database has become corrupt where it was stored. Right. So it is something that we would always enable um, on, on database um, backups. So it's a way of verifying the, the integrity of the backup file itself. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And speaking of verification, there's the, there's the option to restore with verify only. Yeah, absolutely. So we can do, so Restore with Verify Only came along in, I think it was SQL 2005, around that, that mm. time frame. And it enables you to do, SQL Server will go through the entire process of restoring that back, backup file, and it will do everything except writing the pages out to disk. So it's as close as you can get to testing your backup without actually doing a restore. Okay, and, and as we said earlier, testing your backup is something that you should definitely be doing. So this is yeah. a good way to periodically just make sure, hey, I'm, I'm doing these backups. If something does go wrong, are these backups going to help me out? I can do a verify restore to make sure that, uh, Absolutely. that it's going to Absolutely. work. Absolutely, and we would, schedule, we would normally schedule um, restore with verify only uh, to, to test those, those backups. Sure. Have a, have a scheduled uh, plan for it. All right, fantastic. So we talked about backing up and various options for, for the integrity of where we're backing up to. And we, up till now, we've kind of assumed I'm backing up to a local disk. That's mm. the, the most kind of common scenario. But there is this option to back up to Microsoft Azure. So t talk me through that a little bit. Then. So it's a really, really nice feature where um, you can now back up to a URL as it is a feature within the product. So essentially, you can back up to an HTTP address. Um, and the benefit of backing up to Azure, because it's a, a cloud-based service, it's near bottomless storage. So while you, uh, if you're storing your backups locally, you've got to monitor disk space and I've got to justify sure. and two years time, I'm going to have to buy a new SAN, for example, to keep all these backups. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, Microsoft Azure is this public cloud service and you pay for what you consume, um, you can view it as, as bottomless storage effectively to store as many backups, um, mm. as many backups as you like. And of course, that, that's a good point because as databases are used, they grow and therefore the space required to back them up grows. Backups you know, when I first exactly. created a database three years from now, a backup will be bigger. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's a really nice feature to provide um, off-site storage. So um, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, within our business, we use this feature to provide um, off-site storage of our backups and our SQL servers back straight up to Azure. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a really, really nice feature. So the next point on there is this geo-redundant capable. So there are a couple of dozen data centers, Microsoft data centers around the world. And when you prevent, pre when you present this storage and you create this storage object, um, by default, it will be geo redundant. So we have uh, a data center in um, North Europe and West Europe, mm -hmm. I think it's, 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 yeah. it's termed. And um, they're geographically redundant between the two. So if you write a backup file into a geographically redundant um, storage space, um, then it will automatically be duplicated between those two data centers. So I'm protected even, even in the event of a data center going Absolutely. down, which is which is you know, reasonably unlikely, but I guess possible. Um, I'm still protected. My backup is still going to be redundantly stored elsewhere. So. Absolutely. And now we have the encrypted backup feature that, that we've seen um, that allows us to have the backups to be compressed because we care about the storage space that we're going to use. We're paying for everything we And use, encrypted yeah. because it's going off our site, which is really yeah. good. And um, the other nice thing about Azure is that you could restore an Azure backup 
to uh, to your data center. So mm -hmm. you could just restore it straight from, from the cloud. You could restore it to another data center. Um, or you could restore it to a virtual machine sitting in Azure. So these days, that scenario I had about um, motorcycle couriers and disks to, mm. to move data around, what we would do today is to back that database up into Azure and restore it from Azure at the other data center. Mm. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So um, managing these backups to Azure, we, we've got a little sort of screenshot of, of the UI because I guess it's one thing being able to do it, we do want to be able to automate it. We mm. want to be able to, um, you know, define one of these things and then schedule it to, to go and how long we're going to retain it and all the rest of it. So. Yeah. So this is a, a new feature for, for 2014 specifically, and it's, it's slightly separate from the URL feature that, that we just looked at mm -hmm. in the fact that it provides this automated SQL, as it says there, SQL Server backups to Azure. Um, it's very simple to set up. So you basically you just specify the retention period, so one to 30 days, and it will automatically do full backups weekly into Azure Blob Storage, or if there's one gig of, of transaction log uh, use, uh, and it will automatically do transaction log backups every two hours, or if there's five megabytes of, of use in there as well. And the scenarios where we would use this would be for departmental databases, um, databases that you know you need a backup of, but um, it provides a bit of hassle for you to track and manage mm. this kind of thing. So to be able to use managed backups, and I guess for small organizations where you may be um, what we would term these days an accidental DBA, mm. so you're, you're an administrator of, of other uh, technologies, but you have responsibilities for SQL Server. This is a nice feature that's really easy to enable, and it will give you automated um, off-site backups, uh, but it will only run as data changes. So it's a really nice, it's a nice feature. So it's given you, you know, an intelligent off-site backup solution without the overhead of you actually having to, to implement and manage exactly. that yourself. It's exactly. pretty much done for you. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, why don't you give us an example? Why don't you show us about so backing up look. to Azure? Yeah. We're going to start off here in the Microsoft Azure portal. So I have uh, an account with some, some credits within Azure. Um, and these are the services that I can buy from, from Microsoft Azure down on the left-hand side here. Um, so I'm going to go for storage because I want to create a storage account. I'm going to create a storage account. Let's call it uh, MVA demo. And uh, so here I would choose my location or affinity group. So West Europe, we mentioned before. Um, we can also do, um, how about Southeast Asia? Sure. Uh, and that's geographically redundant. So the data we'll put in here will sit in Southeast Asia and will automatically be replicated to East Asia. So it's, it's the closest additional um, location within the same exactly. general geographical area. Exactly. Okay. And by default, it's geo-redundant, so, and we'll keep that on there as well. Okay. So let's kick that uh, storage account created there, um, and we'll have a look. While that's running, we'll have a look at uh, what we're going to do. So first of all, um, because we're backing up to Azure and we have this new... Um, uh, encrypted backup feature that we, that we looked at earlier on. Mm -hmm. um, let's do that on this instance as well. So we already have that. Um, we already have the backup certificate. So once my container is available, I'm going to create a credential called Azure Backups. So credentials within SQL Server is a security uh, construct, if you like, that enables you to define um, a login and a password, in this case a secret, um, to access resources outside of SQL Server. But to then access those credentials, you can just call call the credential itself rather than having to type the, the details in each time. So to be clear about this, because I know this is, this is a point of, of confusion for some people, the thing we create that allows users or applications to access SQL Server is a login, yes, and they use their right. credentials to log in with that login. A credential is something that SQL Server then uses to access something else. It, exactly. It's the identity it uses to, to go yeah, elsewhere. Absolutely. Let's see how our 
storage oh, space. Looks like we're up and running. So we're up and running in Southeast Asia. Um, so what we're going to do here is to manage access keys. So I'm going to take uh, this primary access key and I'm going to put that into the credential that we were just looking at. So this is this is kind of like a password that I can yes. use to get to the store. Exactly, yeah. So let's replace the one that I had here from before. Oh, we've already got one. Oh, then. I've already got it. Let me drop that on because it will be a different secret. So now I'm going to, um, I've got my storage um, account mm -hmm. and now I'm going to uh, have a look at containers. So containers is actually where we're going to be putting, sending the backups to. Okay. So let's create a container there uh, and we'll call that um, MVA. It must be lowercase. Oh, it? sorry. Yep. I always make that mistake. MVA demo. And obviously, we want access to be private. We don't want uh, um, our backups to be um, accessible publicly. Okay. So now we have this uh, MVA demo blob storage container. So if we flick back to SQL Server, we can see down here, this is what I'm backing up to. So this is the URL, and I'm going to back up to... Um, to adjust that. Um, so I'm going to be backing up to this destination. I'm going to be using the Azure Backups credential, mm -hmm. and I'm going to be encrypting this backup with the backup certificate that I created there. Okay. Right, let's see if this works. So it just should take a few seconds at this, and you need to bear in mind that you know we're sat here at, at um, Microsoft in the UK, and I've I've just sent a backup from my laptop to uh, Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, and that's been successful. So let's have a look within our portal. Have a look within container. my container. And you can see I now have this encrypted, compressed backup um, that is sat in Singapore and has mm -hmm. been replicated to Hong Kong. Fantastic. I think that's really cool. That is, that is really useful, yeah. Great. All right, so backing up to Azure, clearly really useful if you want to have your backup stored off-site. This is a really good option for you mm -hmm. rather than managing your own uh, backup media and shipping that off-site to, to somewhere else. We can, we can just back up straight to Azure. So um, one of the other things we want to think about is um, restore scenarios. So um, what if I, I, I need to restore a database that's, I've, I've encrypted the backup, I've, I've backed up the, the database, it's encrypted, and I've lost the server. So yeah. something's happened to the server completely. I've now got this encrypted backup. How do I get it back up and running and, and so on? Exactly. So the purpose of taking a backup is so you can recover the data. Uh, and if it's so uh, super secret encrypted that nobody can access it, even you, it's absolutely useless. Mm. So we need to go through this process of we've seen how to create the encrypted backups, but we also need to make sure that we take a backup of that certificate so we can restore it to another server, to a rebuild of that same server in order to provide um, access to that database again. Okay, so, so we, we've backed up the, uh, the encryption certificate that we used when we um, created the encrypted backup. Exactly, yeah. That gets restored to the new server, yep. and that enables us to decrypt the, the, the encrypted backup. Exactly. Okay. So, and uh, we can have a look at a demo of that if you'd like. Let's do that. Great. minutes now. Great. Okay, so what we have here, so we're building on the previous demo that we did around backup encryption. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is to simulate um, not having this backup certificate. So I'm going to drop the certificate we used to do the backups earlier. Okay. And now I'm going to restore or try and restore the um, AdventureWorks Data Warehouse encrypted compressed backup, which was the last one that we took. And this is one we took in the previous module when we talked about security. This was in um, 
Yes, that's we talked yes. about. Yes, that's right. It was the, the previous module. So now we have this this backup, and this is the error message that we get. So cannot find certificate. So we can't find the certificate required to restore this backup. And this is where it's absolutely crucial for you to keep um, a secure copy of that certificate that you've exported. Okay. And, and hopefully I've still got it from the previous. Well, module. I was going to say, <laughs> fortunately, from recollection, in the last module, one of the things you did was back up the certificate. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't an accident. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do here is to restore the certificate. So I'm creating a certificate from the file. So I had this backup of the certificate with a private key. And remember, um, if you watch the previous module, I set this password up on this file. So this is all I need in order to restore the certificate. So you, so you encrypted the certificate itself with a password? Yes, exactly. And then, then you encrypt, well, you encrypted the backup with the certificate, and then when we backed up the certificate itself, we encrypted it with a password. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So now I can restore this uh, certificate, um, leaving me free to restore the database. And there we go. And, and that would to be true even if it were a different SQL Server exactly, instance, I can restore exactly, the database. Exactly. So it's as simple and straightforward as that, but you absolutely have to have that certificate. Yeah. Okay, uh, fantastic. Let's uh, flip back to the slides and carry on from there. So that was one advanced uh, restore scenario where I've, I've got an encrypted backup and I've lost the server. Um, here's another advanced restore scenario, or, or, or actually a fairly typical uh, uh, restore scenario. I've got a database that's damaged, so mm. perhaps I haven't completely lost the media or lost the server, but the database files themselves have become corrupt, or one of the disks that uh, I've got file groups on has, has become corrupt, or something like that. What do I do then? So this is the uh, the tail log backup scenario that, that we mm. talked about um, earlier on, where this tail log backup, there's, there seems to be a common misconception that the tail log backup, um, it, it's about taking a, a final backup before you do a restore mm. e effectively. But there's a common misunderstanding around the uh, availability of the database that you need to do a tail log backup from. And uh, so there are certain scenarios where the, the data file is missing, but the transaction log is fine. Mm -hmm. You can still do a tail log backup from there. There's also another scenario where um, the uh, the transaction log file itself is missing. The data files there, the transaction log file is missing there. Um, and there are a couple of scenarios where you can still have cached records in memory that you can take a tail back up from. Mm -hmm. So it's always worth, when you've got a corrupt database, trying to take um, a, a tail log back up. Okay. Because um, you've got an opportunity to be a hero there and, and, to, and to restore... Um, additional data that you would normally have lost. Okay, right, that makes sense. Um, so one thing I guess we, we probably ought to talk about in, in this scenario is, and we didn't mention this before, but when restoring transaction log backups, there's that recovery option that we, we need to think about as well. Because of course, what happens when you, re, when you restore a, a backup is we get the database, if you restore a full database backup, we just restore the, the data files. When you restore a transaction log, we actually replay the transactions. And of course, the transaction log may contain some transactions that haven't been committed. So transactions where something started, but we never got to the point where we committed the transaction. So what, what happens with so, that? So we'll go through this process of when SQL Server starts a database, it will read the transaction log from the last checkpoint, um, and it will read the transactions, and it will roll forward transactions that are in the log and were committed, but weren't um, flushed down to disk, if you mm -hmm. like, so they weren't baked down to the data file. Um, but it will also roll back any transactions that were sent down to the transaction log but hadn't been committed. Mm. Um, and this is the recovery process for a database. And when we restore a database, we would restore, if you're looking to restore transaction logs, you'd restore a full backup with no recovery. So you don't want to go through the recovery process mm -hmm. because you're looking to add additional transaction logs in there. And then with the final transaction log, Excuse me. You would um, you would restore that final log with recovery to finalise that recovery process. And, and that final one is, is in this scenario hopefully going to be the tail log. So we'd restore the full 
database with no recovery, would restore all the subsequent transaction logs with no recovery, and then would restore the tail log backup with recovery exactly. at that point and recover the database. Exactly. Okay. Would you like to have a look? I'd love to have a look. <laughs> so in this scenario here, um, I've just got a call. Um, they, uh, my support team has been trying to troubleshoot a database um, and they're in a situation where they've got a database that's offline, which they say has become corrupt. Um, so I can see that it's offline here. So the first thing uh, that I might do is to try and set it online to see what kind of um, information I get. Okay. And what it's showing me down here is the it's unable to open the physical file ctempeople.mdf. So this is the main data file for the people database. So let's have a look um, in the file system and see what we've got here. And so there is there is no file called ctempeople.mdf. So based on that error message, uh, we can conclude that the data file is missing. Okay. So it may be corrupt, it may have been removed when SQL Server was stopped or something like that. Okay. So what we could, what we could do in that situation, uh, the, your first thought is that we're in a recovery situation and you, you know, you're absolutely right to think that. Um, you could uh, delete the database and, and take it from the last restore, but this is where we get into this um, tail log backup scenario. Mm. So if I use this... Um, let me refresh this so you can see what's happened. So what's happened is as we've brought the database online, SQL Server's seen there's no data file, we've got a transaction log, but we're gonna be switched to recovery pending here because I don't have enough information to recover this data. I can't recover the data files because the, the data files aren't there. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what I can do here is a normal log backup to disk, but I'm going to issue. I'm going to issue a with continue after error. So it's not going to like the fact that there is no data file, mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to force it to continue after error, and I'm still able to take a transaction log backup, even though I don't have a data file. Ah, oh, okay, okay. Um, and it's just a normal. You treat it like a normal transaction log backup. So any transactions that were in that log that have occurred. Presumably since the last backup, which might have been a full database backup or it might have been a previous transaction exactly. log backup, I've now got a record of those transactions. Exactly. So, And we can have a look at that as we go through the restore mm -hmm. now. So we're going to restore the database from the last full backup. Notice that we're using uh, with no, no recovery, recovery, which we just mentioned. So then we're going to restore the log, the tail log that we just restored. And that happened successfully. And if we have a count for the number of rows, so there's 250,000 rows there. Mm -hmm. In the database that was corrupt, there was only 200,000 rows. So within the transaction log, there were 50,000 rows just sat within the transaction log that if you hadn't taken a, a tail log backup, that would have been 50,000 sales maybe that, you've that lost, your company yeah. has lost. Um, it's just simply the fact that you didn't try and take a tail log backup. So it's a really, really critical point. And, you know, I agree with you around uh, the DBA's um, role and responsibility around backup and recovery. And, you know, for me, I think it's DBA's number one job is the backup recovery and integrity of the, of the mm. data that they look after. So it's, you know, you should not just know about this, but, you know, practice what you preach as well. Great. Well, thanks for that. Fantastic. Great. So we've seen a number of uh, different um, aspects of backup uh, and restore and, mm -hmm. and specifically that idea of, of coming up with a strategy and making sure that you're, you're using the appropriate types of backups. You're thinking about where you're backing up to in that backup media. And then critically that point about if you've lost the data files or something's happened to the data files, but the log is still accessible, you should at least try to get a, a tail log backup and that might allow you to recover right up to the point where Absolutely. the database was lost. So, a number of things that we've looked at in, in this module. Um, mission critical part of being a, a DBA is ensuring the, the, the recoverability of the database. So, naturally, that's reflected um, extensively if you are studying for the exam. So, make sure you understand the different types of backup that are available, the way that you can combine those backups to come up with a backup strategy, the effect of the recovery model of the database is an important part of that. So make sure you're, you're familiar with what you can and can't do with those recovery models. And 
the, the options for backing up to, to Azure, for, for making sure your backups are compressed or encrypted, and making sure that you can verify the integrity of those backups. And then finally, what to do in the event of a restore, uh, and that uh, scenario for trying to get a tail log backup, first of all, and then typically you would restore the last full database backup that you've got. If you've got differential backups, you'll then restore the most recent differential. Then you'll restore the transaction logs in order, and you'll use no recovery as the option for all of these restores until you get to the very last one, which is hopefully the tail log, and you'll restore that one, and then you should be back to where you, where you lost the database. Okay, well, thanks for uh, your attention in this module. Um, join us again in the next module where we'll look at another aspect of maintaining uh, business continuity of keeping the database uh, available for applications when we look at high availability. So join us for that.